This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Beyond Contempt True Crime. If you haven't yet, go back and listen to episode 4, which is part 1 of Margaret Anderson's story. Let's do a quick recap. Margaret Anderson was living in Green Bay. She was divorced and lived by herself. Her friend, Terry Weasel Affel, stopped over the day after Christmas. Weasel was a biker and belonged to the Drifters Motorcycle Club. The two went out to a movie and had drinks after. Margaret and Terry ended up at a biker bar called the Back 40, which was owned by drifter Mark Shotgun Lukensmeyer. She was drunk and got into a fight with other women at the bar. Terry and Margaret left, then they got into a fight in his car. He told her she was walking home, pulled her out of the car by her hair, and kicked her several times. Athel kicked her one final time towards the three DC Eagles. Dennis Bobber Stumpner, Mark A.D. Hinton, and Randy Gargoyle Whiting, who were waiting outside for a ride home. The three DC Eagles beat on Margaret. Bartender Chris Shevlik saw this whole event unfold when she was heading home, and she told the Eagles to leave Margaret alone. Her boss, Mark Lukensmeyer, joined the Eagles with beating on Margaret and told Chris to leave, which she did. You're listening to Episode 5, Margaret Anderson. Part 2 of 2. Lukensmeyer unlocked the side door of the back 40, and all four men took Margaret back inside. At this point, Margaret was crying, both out of fear and pain. The next two hours were beyond comprehension. It was a torturous hell of extreme sexual assault and physical violence. Lukensmeyer poured everyone taps of beer, which they drank for a while, but quickly turned their attention to Margaret. They removed her clothes as they touched her. The biker's pants hit the ground, and they all demanded oral sex. Because of all the alcohol and drugs consumed that day, none of the men could get an erection. The night then turned into a session of physical abuse, and law enforcement saw the degree of that abuse on the autopsy. Margaret fought with all her fury. Her legs willfully flapped and fluttered to resist what was happening. She kicked as hard as she could, and her foot landed squarely on Dennis Stumpner's groin. Officer Chick, who had just given Lukensmeyer's girlfriend a ride home the hour before, was now driving past all the bars. He was doing his usual rounds to ensure that all establishments were closed for the 1 a.m. bar time. He drove by the back 40 at 1.30 and noticed Donna's Grand Torino remained parked at the bar. Officer Chick saw a man who was sitting on the trunk of the car. He acknowledged the stocky man, and the man nodded back at him. Instead of stopping, He drove right by the back 40, not knowing what was going on inside. He normally would only stop to check a bar if he saw several cars in the parking lot. Later on in the investigation, they figured that the man on the trunk was D.C. Eagle Stumpner, since Officer Chick didn't recognize him, but was familiar with Lukensmeyer, Hinton, and Whiting. Back inside the bar, Margaret was fighting for her life. They pinned her down on the pool table, and Whiting beat her with a cue stick. Later... Hinton would use that same cue stick to shove a cue ball into Margaret's vagina. During the fight, Margaret grabbed Whiting's buck knife. She made wild swings, not knowing or caring who she connected with. Margaret made contact and sliced Stumpner's stomach, which took him out of the fight. The time was 3 a.m., and all the wild energy had mostly drained from the room. The foreman decided that it was time to leave the bar. Margaret was conscious, but she was going into shock. She put on her clothes as best she could, and they all left the bar. Hinton dragged her into the Grand Torino and pushed her into the back seat. Whiting sat in the back with Stumpner. Lukensmeyer drove, and Hinton sat in the passenger seat. Lukensmeyer took a ride onto Main Street and drove for about two miles until he had a stop and let Hinton out to puke. After they regrouped, Lukensmeyer turned on to Limekiln Road, He drove up the hill to Packerland Packing and turned into the company's manure clean-out area. Hinton opened the door and let Margaret and Whiting out. Whiting pulled Margaret toward the back left corner of the area. Margaret was so weakened by everything she had already endured that she stopped all resistance. He pushed her over the two-foot concrete retaining wall and dragged her a few more feet. Whiting took his buck knife out, grabbed Margaret from behind, and sliced her across the neck. Blood was everywhere. Margaret was on her knees, clutching her neck, 
not knowing what happened. Whiting headed back to the car, grabbed a yellow booty that had fallen out of Margaret's pocket, wiped off his knife blade, and tossed it back onto the ground. Hinton got out of the car to let Whiting into the back seat. Lukensmeyer peeled out of the driveway and the four men went off into the frigid Wisconsin winter night. No one in the car asked questions or even said a word. Not everyone in the car knew what just happened, but even the heartless could have acknowledged that Margaret was in bad shape, at a minimum, and was left out in the dangerous Wisconsin winter weather. Once police had identified Margaret, everything came together at a fast and furious pace. They pieced together her night on the town with Haffel. She had also been seeing a man named Lee. He met Margaret at a bar and had only known her for a few months. Lee was still going through a divorce. Margaret got super serious and wanted to get married, so Lee backed out of the relationship. Law enforcement quickly ruled him out. Next, the police talked to the owner of the surf club, too. They verified that Margaret was there with Affle and cashed her unemployment check. Police got a tip from an informant that the car involved in the crime was at the Chicago Brake Beam Shop in Ashwabanon, a suburb of Green Bay. Someone changed the tires on the vehicle after the night of the crime. When law enforcement visited the business two days after the murder, they found a 1974 Grand Torino registered to Adana J. Vanderveeren. They worked on getting a search warrant. On the next morning, Terry Weasel Affle went in for his police interview with his attorney in tow. He told the police about his kicking Margaret in the back 40 parking lot, but claimed she laid on the pavement when he drove off. When news reports came out, he became scared because people had seen him kicking Margaret that night. Detectives went back to Chicago Breakbeam Shop, where Mark Lukensmeyer's brother, Russell, was a business manager. They verified that Mark Lukensmeyer worked on a car there and found straw on the floor where the car had been. The dumpster also had a large amount of sweepings. Law enforcement had the dumpster hauled back to the police headquarters. Detectives went to the back 40 and examined the alley outside the bar. They found blood frozen in snow. They shoveled it out and kept it for evidence. Detectives interviewed Donna, and she gave a version of events from that night. When she drove the car to work that morning after the murder, she noticed nothing unusual. When she returned home from work that day, Lukensmeyer said he had to run an errand and took her car. She was already mad at him for the stress he caused the night before, and their relationship had not been going well. She had wanted to move out after the holidays. When she heard about the murder on Lime Kiln Road, she had an uneasy feeling that maybe her car was involved. She called her brother and quickly moved out with her kids before Lukensmeyer returned from running errands. Police searched Donna's car for evidence and took photographs. Officers closed down the back 40 three days after the murder and they guarded it until they got a search warrant. They collected fibers from the pool table and carpet, a broken cue stick, and hair strands from the pool table. Bartender Chris Shevlik was interviewed and confirmed that Margaret had been at the back 40 with Terry Affle. Lukensmeyer called the police to find out if they had a warrant for his arrest, and they immediately scheduled an interview for him. In the background, there were rumors that the motorcycle clubs might hit the Green Bay Police Department, so they moved their meeting with Lukensmeyer to the De Pere Police Station, which was about 10 minutes away. Prosecutor Peter Naz offered Mark Schock and Lukensmeyer an immunity agreement. He was to give a statement that detailed the events that took place that night, provided that he played no part in the beating, sexual assault, and murder of Margaret. Lukensmeyer signed the agreement, and police hit him at a hotel that night. They interviewed him the next day, January 1, 1984. Lukensmeyer said he opened the bar at 1.45, and Whiting, Hinton, and Stumpner came over. He got drunk before going to his girlfriend's car where he fell asleep. Hinton knocked on the window and woke him up. The three DC Eagles and Margaret wanted a ride. He noticed that Margaret had blood on her face. They got in the car and directed him to the manure clean-out area across from Packerland Packing. Hinton got out of the passenger side to let Whiting and Margaret out of the back seat of the two-door car. Hinton got back in and told Lukensmeyer to pull forward to the driveway entrance. Whiting returned 15 minutes later and they left. He drove them to Hinton's house on 4th Street and then he drove home. Nothing was said in the car. 
The next day, Lukensmeyer took a cab to the back 40 to clean up the bar. He heard on the news that there had been a body found on Limekiln Road, and he thought he was in big trouble. Weasel gave him a ride back home. He then borrowed his girlfriend's Gran Torino and went to his brother's house. He borrowed his brother's car and drove back home. Donna had moved out, so he went out drinking. Two days after the murder, he drove to the brass rail to help Hinton and Whiting with their stalled red pinto. He confronted them and asked why they had involved him in this situation. They had no response. Next, the men went to the back 40 and gathered the garbage bags that Lukensmeyer had put out the day prior. They drove the garbage over to Chicago Brake Beam Shop. Lukensmeyer's brother had the Gran Torino there and had already put new snow tires on the vehicle. Lukensmeyer cleaned a blood smear up the rear passenger seat. Whiting took the trash bags and tossed them into the dumpster. He dropped Hinton and Whiting off at Hinton's house and never heard from them after that. Police had inquired about the third DC Eagle, but Lukensmeyer only knew him as Bobber and did not know his real name. When the interview was over, police put Lukensmeyer in protective custody and put his home under surveillance. He was honestly more afraid of the DC Eagles than the district attorney. After a few calls and some digging, police discovered that Hinton had an active non-felony arrest warrant for him in Ottagami County, which is the county next door to Green Bay. This was something that law enforcement would keep in their back pocket. Police compiled info about Bobber since he was a mystery. They showed Lukensmeyer a photo of someone named Dennis Stumpner, and he confirmed that it was indeed Bobber. When police checked records, Stumpner had several active warrants, including three DUIs in the past five years. Law enforcement got a warrant to search Randy Whiting's house and found a green parka, a 10-inch knife with a case, and a pocket knife with a case. They issued an arrest warrant for Randy Gargoyle Whiting. Law enforcement went to Hinton's house to arrest him. He was gone, but his girlfriend was there with her two kids. She had not seen him since December 28th. They checked one of his places of employment, Spanky's, but they had fired him weeks prior. Hinton called into the police station and said he would show up with an attorney to turn himself in later that day. He claimed he did not know where Randy was. Police kept Mark 80 Hinton in jail on a probation hold until they could figure out exactly what to charge him with. Donna Vanderveren gave the detectives another statement, but would not sign it out of fear until they arrested all the suspects. Police got a tip from an informant in Wassa that reported he had spotted Whiting and his girlfriend Vicky. Hinton and his girlfriend Barb had also been at his house. Vicky drove Hinton back to Green Bay so he could turn himself in. When the informant was questioned again, he gave a different timeline of events. Many people were telling half-truths or flat-out lying. This time period resulted in many bogus sightings, dead ends, and wild goose chases. The D.C. Eagles created many of these so-called tips that police were receiving and had third parties pass on misinformation to law enforcement to throw them off the trail. Detectives visited Stumpner's brother-in-law, who had last seen him on the 28th of December. Stumpner wanted money, and they had argued. He packed a duffel bag and left. Police issued an arrest warrant for Dennis Bobber Stumpner. Protective custody shifts for Lukensmeyer deteriorated. The police became the parent and Lukensmeyer the child, whom they were babysitting. He was growing bolder and wanted to go drinking in a different city. Police told him no, and he wasn't allowed to leave Green Bay. Lukensmeyer's brother told him to behave and that he better not screw up this agreement he had with police. Mark Schock and Lukensmeyer snuck away to a bar in Denmark, a city 20 minutes outside of Green Bay. And then he went to another bar in Cooperstown. A patron called the police department to complain because they didn't like being put in harm's way by having Lukensmeyer in the same bar. He returned home drunk that night and ended up receiving two drunk driving tickets that year. At the end of January, Lukensmeyer signed an agreement with police stating that he no longer wanted their protection. Margaret's family was getting impatient, and they wanted justice. There were rumors that Margaret's uncle was going to show up at the back 40 with his gun to show them that they can't get away with murder. Another claim was that friends and relatives were raising money to hire a hitman from Chicago, and they had raised $25,000. Bobby Sr. and Jr. started drinking together. They took a special interest in the hunt for the killers, and revenge fantasies were always playing on a loop in their minds. 
Bobby Jr. didn't attend much of his last semester of high school because of how upsetting the whole situation was for him. He spent his time watching the news so he could keep up to date with the hunt for the fugitives. Bob Sr. asked his girlfriend if she could handle a shotgun because he heard Whiting had an M16 and a couple of 9mm. His girlfriend, Mary Lou Van Pay, had been drinking when she called police and told them if they didn't get this case solved, she was worried Bobby Sr. and Jr. would take the law into their own hands. Detective Jerry Rogalski only worked on the periphery of the Margaret Anderson case for the first few months because he was only a fledgling detective at that point. When he stopped in a bar called Gino's on Monday, April 9th, everything was about to change for the young detective. Gino's was located on Lime Kiln Road, the same road where Margaret Anderson took her final breath. The bar was one among many bars in that area, which was known as Little Chicago. The detective sat down and made small talk with a bartender named Carol Cruz. Her husband, Wayne Cruz, was a biker who had been a drifter. Wayne was still friends with some of the club members, including Mark Shotgun Lukensmeyer. The detective had been in the bar the previous night and had forged a friendly relationship with bartender Carol. Tonight, Carol was alone behind the bar, and she felt comfortable with Jerry. She asked him why he protected that scumbag Lukensmeyer. Margaret was a friend of hers. It was sick what Mark and the rest did to her. Carol said Lukensmeyer told her husband he burned his clothes on the night of the murder. She said the drifter's woman had a meeting the day after the murder to discuss everything. She said the cops did not realize the level of Lukensmeyer's direct involvement. Carol squarely said to the detective, How dumb can you cops be? She added that bartender Chris Shevlik knew what took place at the back 40. Detective Rogalski told her that the district attorney might have a secret John Doe hearing to get the testimony that could help this case. Carol responded that many people knew what went on that night, and they would likely not talk unless they had to. She was personally fearful of what her husband would do to her if he ever found out she said a word about any of this. The detective's heart nearly leapt out of his chest after this conversation, and he barely slept at all that night. The next day, he told the DA about his discussion at Gino's bar. With this new information, the DA immediately called the Jane Doe hearing, which meant that he could subpoena witnesses to testify for information gathering purposes. This hearing was not considered a trial, but everyone would appear before a judge. In Wisconsin, it's a prosecution tool used by investigators to determine if a crime occurred and figure out who took part. Carol Cruz, Wayne Cruz, and Chris Shevlik were all subpoenaed. Lukensmeyer was re-interviewed a few days later and admitted to burning his jacket because there was blood on his sleeve. He stated that he did not know how it got there. Lukensmeyer made it known that he did not want to get the three DC Eagles in any legal trouble because testifying against them could cost him his life. Mark Hinton was sitting in jail, so police thought this would be a perfect time to put pressure on him. Hinton gave police a 10-page statement where he revealed just enough information without giving away everything. Police asked him directly, Did Whiting tell you he murdered Margaret Anderson? Hinton's response was, Yes. Hinton also tried to distance himself from the DC Eagles in an effort to distance himself from club relationships and affiliations he had. He said he wasn't a member of the DC Eagles, but had applied for membership. Police released Hinton from jail after he gave his statement. The DA was tempted to charge Hinton, but he knew that he would need him later on. It was now May 1984, five months after the murder of Margaret Anderson. Randy Gargoyle Whiting and Dennis Bobber Sumpner were still on the run. All kinds of crazy tips came in. First, Randy was living in Seymour. Then Randy and Vicky were headed to California. Someone reported that Bobber was in Colorado. Police had to change their approach of chasing these fake and wild leads. It was wasting valuable resources. They needed to keep the pressure on the biker community and also the suspects' families. Police also had two other high-profile murders going on at the same time, which was a rarity in Green Bay. Administrators reduced resources for the case, but motivation remained strong with the police force. They displayed Margaret's picture at every detective meeting, which gave the team a sense of purpose. Detectives Perrins and Rogalski were relentless in their investigation and tackled every angle. 
It consumed their lives and bordered on obsession. They visited Jack and Chris Shivlik at their rural Kiwani home and served as a reminder to those in the biker community that the police were not going to let this investigation fade away and that justice for Margaret was coming. Randy Whiting's grandmother passed away that summer, and police attended the funeral to see if Whiting would make an appearance. He didn't. Randy took the time to send police two letters that year. He wanted the reward money to go to the person who turned him in. Randy wanted Stumpner and Hinton to be released from any charges and outstanding warrants. He demanded that his trial take place outside of Green Bay, and he wanted the news media of his choice to be present to ensure his safety. It worried Randy that police would shoot him. Unsurprisingly, the district attorney rejected all these conditions. Police thought Randy and his girlfriend were together the whole time Randy was on the run. They'd later learn that he had Vicky meet him in Indiana. Randy had taken a job with a carnival company where he worked a bushel basket game. Vicky joined the carnival too and worked at a children's duck pond game. They stayed at a hotel in Indianapolis and checked in with different names. Vicky even had a miscarriage and was hospitalized. The carnival traveled to Michigan and Illinois. Vicky had not taken to that lifestyle well and was physically abused by Whiting, so she returned home to Wisconsin. Detective parents met with law enforcement all over northern Wisconsin. He built relationships and was looking to gain their local expertise on the D.C. Eagles since they had limited resources in Green Bay. These relationships paid off. FBI agent Tom Berg saw a flyer in the city of Appleton which was advertising a country concert where the proceedings would go to the defense funds for Whiting, Hinton, and Stumpner. The Green Bay detectives attended the concert, but they did not see their fugitives. The FBI agent noticed another flyer with an Anago phone number in Langley County, which was not even near the advertised location of the concert. The agent tracked down the number, which was more difficult since it was before the age of the internet. The number was tied to a biker named Frank Burns, who owned many acres of land. On Frank's property, there was a truck and trailer registered to D.C. Eagle, Frank Frog Seabants. Police also knew Whiting had stayed at Frog's northern Wisconsin cabin in the past, so the FBI agent asked the local law enforcement in Langley County to keep an eye on that property. He thought the D.C. Eagles would hide Whiting there. Local law enforcement showed Whiting's photo to a few select area people. They didn't want to tip off the D.C. Eagles that they were searching the area. Another tip came in when an individual sat down in a biker bar next to someone who looked like Whiting, but he looked different from the picture police showed. He no longer had his long blonde hair and a ponytail with a beard. This person had short jet black hair and was clean shaven. Detective Perrins drove up to Langley County to watch the trailer. He saw a man on the front lawn who had jet black hair Parents stopped at a tavern down the street called Teal's Bar and struck up a conversation with the bartender. She said the people from the trailer were strange and hadn't lived there long. Detective Parents thought he might have found his guy. Langlade officer Dave Steger had noticed that there was an advertisement in a shopping guide for a rummage sale. They had bunk beds, furniture, a gun, stereo speakers, and a car for sale. A light went on in his head. This was the same address as Frog Seabance's trailer. Dave figured a rummage sale was the easiest search warrant that an officer could hope for. Officer Ben Baker arrived at Dave Seeger's home the next morning. As they left for the rummage sale, Dave's wife Sue insisted that she go along. Both men tried to talk her out of it, but she didn't listen. They jumped in Steger's beat-up truck and headed to the sale. Dave had been off duty for a few days and wasn't clean-shaven. He had on a flannel shirt and fit perfectly into the northern Wisconsin landscape. The addition of his wife taken along only added to their cover. Sue was in her McDonald's uniform, and they would drop her off at work after the rummage sale. She did not understand this trip involved covert police work, or that they would interact with a fugitive wanted for murder. As the trio arrived, Frog Seabance was leaving the property. A pregnant woman, who was Frog's girlfriend, greeted them and invited everyone inside the trailer to look at the furniture. A woman walked to the end of the trailer and was not really in sight. Later, they would learn that this was Whiting's girlfriend, Vicki Chamberlain. There was a male sitting on the couch in a shirt with jeans. His hair was unnaturally black, as if he used shoe polish to dye it. He had a large tattoo of an eagle and a snake on his arm. He was missing a tooth on the left side of his mouth. It was him. 
Sue plunked right down on the couch next to Whiting as the two police officers pretended to check out the fabric and the chairs. Steger thought to himself that his wife will kill him when she finds out. Frog's girlfriend, Jerry, pulled the gun out of a holster. She handed it to Dave and asked him if he wanted to buy it. He pulled the clip out to make sure it was empty and attempted to check the chamber, but when he tried to pull the slide back, he couldn't get it to open. Whiting jumped up off the couch and reached for the gun. Dave's heart rate sped up, thinking that Whiting was on to him. Instead, Whiting asked if he was sure that they didn't want to buy the gun. Whiting pulled back the slide and then returned the gun to the holster. The officers thought it was time to get the heck out of there. On the way out, Dave borrowed a tape measure to assess the size of the bunk beds to appear authentic and to placate his wife. He told Whiting they needed to measure their bedroom to make sure the beds would fit. Dave said they had to get Sue to work and they would be back later to pick up the bunks. Whiting's location was confirmed. The three got back into the truck and Dave said, He's there. Sue wanted to know who's there. Dave said, Gargoyle, the guy that killed the girl in Green Bay. They told Sue, You know, that guy you sat next to in the trailer? Sue was so angry about the situation, it was minutes before she stopped chewing her husband out. Ben and Dave regrouped, and they headed to Teal's Bar, down the street from the rummage sale. The two officers took over the bar and made it their temporary police headquarters. They made calls. They had a local officer come down in an unmarked car. Then they called the Green Bay Police Department. Four officers, including Detective Perrins, raced to Langley County in unmarked cars. The detectives ran red lights and even had a state patrol officer pull them over on their journey. They called in all surrounding jurisdictions. Police at Teals had to set up a blockade to turn away traffic that was heading towards the rummage sale. Officers cut off the phone service to the trailer. After preparing everyone, several officers with their camel rifles and painted faces belly crawled through the tall grass and surrounded the trailer. There were hitches to this plan. They planned to reactivate the phone and call the occupants of the trailer to tell them that they were surrounded. Unfortunately, there was a busy signal and police could not get through. Frog Seabance was heading back to the trailer. They detained him at a roadblock and kept him inside Teal's bar. Frog's girlfriend walked down to the driveway to get the mail. Jerry looked to her right down the road and saw squad cars sitting at Teal's. She looked left and saw more squad cars. Jerry yelled to everyone that they were surrounded as she waved her hands and ran back into the trailer. Whiting ran out the back door. His girlfriend Vicky was right on his heels. Jerry trailed behind them. Officers stood up and pointed their guns. Both women turned and ran back inside, while Whiting dove under the trailer skirting. All the squad cars descended onto the property. They brought out a canine officer, and her dog was amped up and barking. When 24-year-old Whiting heard the dog, he immediately surrendered. Officers removed a buck knife from his belt. Vicky and Jerry both surrendered as well. Detective Perrins asked, Are you Randy Whiting? And the man said yes. Parents slapped on cuffs and read him Miranda rights. Frog Seabance, Jerry, and Vicky were all arrested too. When Whiting was in an interview room, he joked with Baker and asked him if he was still interested in buying the bunk beds. Whiting claimed he was going to turn himself in the next week but wanted to spend time with his girlfriend, and he claimed that he'd never left Wisconsin. He talked about the day of the murder. He drank all day and smoked a few joints and didn't need a lot. Randy denied killing Margaret Anderson and barely remembered anything after bar closing. He heard about the murder three days later. Randy said if he killed the woman the way the police said it happened, he would not forget that, which is why he was innocent. Police asked him if that one of the other men killed Margaret, why didn't he stop it from happening? Randy said that would have put his life on the line. Police asked if he talked to the guy who committed the murder. He responded that he might have, yes, but Randy would rather die than narc on someone. The detective was struck by how cold and unemotional Whiting was. Randy said when they ran, he and Bobber split up to make them harder to catch. The detectives took a deep breath. They finally caught Gargoyle after eight months of chasing him. The biker community was still silent and operated under a code of snitches get stitches. There was a substantial amount of physical evidence, but no independent witnesses who could link the perpetrator to the crime. The only individuals available were four bikers in the bar that night, and none of them were talking. 
The district attorney expected this and decided not to charge Lukensmeyer and Hinton because he had to get testimony from them. The preliminary hearing began and its purpose was to ensure that there was enough evidence to move to trial. Besides the officers on the scene when Margaret died and the coroner, Mark Shotgun Lukensmeyer took the stand. He briefly recounted the night. Mark Hinton was second and claimed to have not remembered anything about that night. He pled the fifth and refused to answer questions. The DA brought out that 10-page statement he had signed back in May to get out of jail. The judge instructed him to answer the questions, but he refused. So the DA read his statement for him. On cross-examination, Whiting's lawyer, Mary Lou Robinson, pointed out that Hinton's statement from May conflicted with some of Lukensmeyer's statements because it was helpful for both of them to point the finger at someone else. That someone else being her client, Randy Whiting. She asked the court to dismiss the charges against Mr. Whiting. The judge did not buy this and moved forward with the proceeding. Randy entered a plea of not guilty, and they set his trial date for March 1985. Before the trial, Whiting requested permission to marry Vicki Chamberlain. They had a civil service in the county jail on the 30th of November, 1984. The D.C. Eagles ordered this to limit how much they could ask her to testify. Leading up to the trial, they collected a key piece of additional evidence. In December of that year, Carol Cruz from Gino's Bar said Lukensmeyer told her husband Wayne that he purchased a new cue ball the day after the murder to replace the one that was found inside Margaret. She overheard that Lukensmeyer said the men held Margaret down and jumped on her stomach to get the cue ball dislodged. Carol said Lukensmeyer said he'd never testify against Whiting and had plans to leave the area when the case came up for trial. And she was also divorcing her husband Wayne because he terrified her. The DA appreciated all the extra evidence collected by detectives. There were 300 pieces of evidence which filled an entire room at the police station. The amount of evidence was an advantage for the prosecution and would make it difficult for the defense, as it would be hard for them to even know what to prepare for. Judge Alexander Grant understood that this was the biggest case in Green Bay's history and decided that they would import a jury from outside the area. Jury selection took place in Port Washington, which was a city north of Milwaukee. Selected jurors would have three hours to arrange their life and return for their bus ride to Green Bay. On the first day of the trial, it was standing room only as they packed all of the media like sardines into the courtroom for the state versus Whiting. The opening statement started and the prosecutor immediately dressed the Lukensmeyer immunity deal. He explained that police did not understand at that point what happened inside the back 40 or at Packerland Packing Manure area. They had to use Lukensmeyer's statement as a starting point. He explained that they rescinded the immunity deal when evidence had turned up that Lukensmeyer was not sleeping in his car when the beatings and sexual assault took place, as he had claimed. He had not lived up to the terms of the agreement, so they terminated it. The defense immediately pushed back on this in her opening statement. Lukensmeyer was the only non-DC Eagle, and the defense knew he would be their most obvious choice to lay the blame on. She said Lukensmeyer took the lead in the crime, and the evidence will prove it. It was his bar after all. The first few days of the trial, the court heard from the citizens and the police officers who were with Margaret when she died on Limekiln Road. The defense grilled one of the police sergeants for not adequately measuring the tire tracks or footprints. The sergeant who doubled as the police sketch artist responded that he was involved in many things that day, and he couldn't worry about the tire tracks. He had to get to the morgue to sketch a composite of the victim since her face was so badly bruised that she couldn't be identified. On day three, defense attorney Robinson continued to criticize law enforcement's methods of evidence collection. The prosecution had a variety of people on the stand, from the police who collected evidence to the truck drivers that encountered Margaret as she stumbled onto Lime Kiln Road. Another detective was called to the stand to describe what he had witnessed during the autopsy. He had attended the procedure to take photographs and collect evidence. The detective explained how a wood-type material was removed from her chest and they removed a cue ball from inside Margaret. This was a salient moment in the trial, and the jury began to truly comprehend the brutality of what Margaret had suffered. On day four, Terry Effel and Chris Shevlik took the stand. Terry Effel explained that both motorcycle clubs got along well at functions and events, 
but really didn't intermingle at internal meetings. He recalled the night of the back 40, where Margaret got into a fight with another woman, and the bartender recommended that he take Margaret out of the bar before things got out of control. Terry stated that when they were in the car and getting ready to leave, Margaret became belligerent. He got out, walked around the car to her side, and told her that she was walking home. She didn't move, so he grabbed her by the hair and took her out of the car. He said he wears steel toe boots because of a severe leg injury. Terry yelled and screamed at her, then kicked her in the rear end a few times. He got in the car and drove away. Terry said he didn't remember saying a word to the DC Eagles when he left. The statement was a convenient omission, based on what other witnesses had seen. The prosecutor asked Affle why in his initial interview with police he never mentioned the DC Eagles being outside the bar. He said he never mentioned it because they didn't ask him. The defense used this as an opportunity to place blame on Affle for the damage found on Margaret's body. She got Affle to lose his composure on the stand when she asked him if he wanted to kill Margaret. Terry said he didn't want to kill her. He wanted her out of his car, out of his face, and out of his life. She asked him to step out of the witness box and show the jury his steel toe boots, which were the same ones he wore the night of the crime. Chris Shivlik took the stand and had crucial testimony that supported the state's case. She was the only witness who was sober and could explain the events that took place at bar time. She witnessed Affel kicking Margaret and told him to stop. He kicked and shoved her towards Bobber, Gargoyle, and A.D., and said that they could have her. They could screw her brains out. Chris said the three eagles kicked Margaret in the alley, and she yelled at them to stop. Her boss, Mark Lukensmeyer, told her to shut up and leave. Lukensmeyer then joined in the abuse of Margaret. The next day at work, she saw blood outside the step of the bar's alley doorway and more blood on the pavement close by. The prosecutor asked Chris why she had not mentioned the four men being in the alley in her initial statement to police. She said she was too afraid to. When cross-examined by the defense, she admitted her husband told her not to tell the police those details. Her husband was the president of the Drifters, and there was a code he wanted maintained. On day five, Officer Chick testified that he drove Donna Vanderveeren home when her boyfriend wouldn't give her the keys to her car. He suggested that she get one of the Drifters to drive her home, but she said that there were no Drifters and only DC Eagles in the bar. He drove past the back 40 at 1.30 a.m. and saw Donna's Grand Torino parked there. Next, Lukensmeyer testified that he was no longer in the Drifters Club. He also said that Margaret Affle and all three DC Eagles drank a significant amount of alcohol that evening. He recounted the scuffle that Margaret had got into with the Drifters' women. He removed himself from the scene and claimed he went out to the car during closing time and stayed there for two hours. He said Chris was in charge of locking up the bar. He continued that A.D. knocked on the door and woke him up because they all needed a ride. Lukensmeyer had backed away from some of his prior statements he had given law enforcement, so Prosecutor Nas went after him. The D.A. asked Lukensmeyer if he saw blood on Margaret, and he said he did not, which went against his original statement to the police. Lukensmeyer kept pleading the Fifth Amendment. Do you remember them getting in the car? I plead the Fifth. Did you stop the car at the clean-out pit at Packerland Packing? I plead the fifth. Did anyone get out of the car at Packerland Packing? I plead the fifth. Do you remember there being one less person in the car when you left the Packerland Packing clean-out pit? I plead the fifth. Did you burn the coat you were wearing the night of the murder? I plead the fifth. You said all the DC Eagles got out of the car with Margaret and came back without her. After he heard her moan, Whiting returned to the car alone. Lukensmeyer said he remembered nothing like that. He refused to come clean on any of the prior statements he had made to the police and invoked the Fifth Amendment. Lukensmeyer said he was worried that the D.C. Eagles would try to frame him for the murder. On cross-examination, the defense wanted to create reasonable doubt for Randy Whiting and wanted to open the door to the possibility that Mark Lukensmeyer was the killer. Lukensmeyer claimed he quit the drifters months before the murder. The defense asked him, how does someone quit a motorcycle club? Mark says he stopped attending meetings and functions. She asked him if he discussed buying a new cue ball with Wayne Cruz. Lukensmeyer pled the fifth. Did you clean out the car on December 27, 1983? I plead the fifth. When you burned your coat, were you worried about coat fibers being found on Margaret Anderson? 
I plead the fifth. Between all the questions both sides had asked him, Luke and Smyre pled the fifth 50 times. They called Wayne Cruz to the stand. Wayne met with Luke and Smyre on December 27th at the back 40 and said Whiting, Stumpner, and Hinton had beat Margaret up. Luke and Smyre told him he fell asleep after Margaret kicked Stumpner in the groin. He said Luke and Smyre told him about the DC Eagles throwing Margaret over the cement wall at the clean-out pit, but couldn't remember which one he said did that. The defense asked if Luke and Smyre told him about the cue ball that was inserted into her vagina. Wayne said he heard about that from Luke and Smyre, but he also heard about it from others. Wayne originally told his wife that Hinton killed Margaret, then later changed it to Whiting, and then he wasn't sure which one Luke and Smyre told him. Mark Hinton got on the stand on day six and disavowed any affiliation with the D.C. Eagles. He said he quit the summer after the murder. Mark said Affle pushed Margaret towards them in the alley at closing time. Luke and Smyre unlocked the door to the bar, and they all went inside. The men took their clothes off, and Margaret's too. He said that they were just trying to have a good time and make whatever sexual advances they could, but they all drank so much that they couldn't get it up. He claimed to have left that activity to go get a beer and play a video game, and then fell asleep on the bar. Whiting woke him up when Luke and Smyre was getting carried away. He was yelling at Margaret for embarrassing him, and he was beating on her. The prosecutor wanted to know why Hinton said nothing about this in his 10-page statement he gave in May of 1984. Hinton painted Luke and Smyre as an instigator. He slapped and punched and beat Margaret with a pool cue until it ultimately broke over her. The prosecutor asked, What was Randy doing at that time? Hinton said Randy was just standing there. Hinton continued, Nobody was being nice to her after she knifed Bobber, but Luke and Smyre was the only one beating on her. When the men were leaving, they all discussed what to do with Margaret. They wanted to drop her at the hospital, but there would be too many questions. Shotgun Luke and Smyre said he knew where to take her. At Packerland Packing, Whiting and Luke and Smyre got out of the car, but Margaret didn't come back with them. Whiting returned to the car first, then Luke and Smyre. This conflicted with his 10-page statement, which originally showed Whiting was the only one to get out of the car. The prosecutor pointed out that when he had his police interview, they asked him if Whiting killed Margaret, and Hinton's response was a clear yes. The prosecutor asked Hinton if he remembered that, and Hinton said he did not. It pleased the defense that Hinton was limiting her client's role in the crime, but she was worried about his lack of credibility. She asked Hinton if the most important thing after Margaret's death was to save himself. Hinton said yes. Then she asked Hinton that, in a circle of friends, when they all ran into trouble, was the rule to leave everyone else out of it? Hinton said yes. Did the statement you made in May, right before you got out of jail, leave everything out that might hurt Lukensmeyer? Hinton said yes. The prosecutor then requestioned Hinton and asked if he gave his statement in a way where he didn't have to lie that he just admitted much of the truth. Hinton said yes. On day seven, after Hinton finished up on the stand, DA shifted to his scientific witness. The crime lab analyst confirmed that they had recovered the cue sticks from the dumpster at Chicago Breakbeam, which had hair caught in the broken sections consistent with Margaret's. The defense then asked, of all the hundreds of pieces of evidence in this case, does a single result point to Whiting? The analyst said no. On day eight, Donna Vanderveeren testified that she had dated Lukensmeyer for eight years and had known him well. She took her car to run errands and saw a smudge on the headrest of the driver's seat. It looked like one of Mark's friends had a bloody nose or something of that nature. That night, she told him to clean up the car, and he immediately did, which was not in his character. Lukensmeyer took the keys and said he needed to use the car. Donna thought something was up. So she called her brother and asked him to quick move her and the kids out. She packed everything in 30 minutes and left. On day 9, the jury watched a videotaped deposition for a pregnant Vicki Chamberlain Whiting, who was stressed from the death threats she received from Margaret Anderson's family. She said after the murder, she noticed nothing different or new with Randy's behavior until January 2nd or 3rd, when he became scared because he thought he might be in big trouble. The prosecutor put another detective on the stand. He had interviewed Hinton back in May of 1984 and asked him if Whiting told him that he had murdered Margaret. Hinton told him yes without hesitation. Defense chose not to put Whiting on the stand 
because she thought they created enough reasonable doubt, especially with the conflicting testimony of Lukensmeyer and Hinton. The two attorneys met in the judge's chambers to discuss jury instructions. The prosecutor requested that the jury receive instructions that would allow them to convict under the party to a crime law. In Wisconsin, they can convict people as long as the state showed beyond a reasonable doubt that someone was a willing participant in a crime. It outraged the defense because she insisted that the state had not proved their case. The prosecution said Hinton and Lukensmeyer's testimony was enough to prove that, that Whiting, at a minimum, aided in the murder. The judge agreed with the prosecutor, and on day 10, party to crime instructions were given to the jury. Closing arguments began. Prosecutor Peter Nas pointed out the terror and pain Margaret endured at the back 40, and there was no way anyone could have slept through the event. He said that there was one fact that remained consistent with every single witness. Randy Whiting got out of the car with Margaret Anderson. The prosecutor emphasized that the jury returned a guilty verdict, whether they think Randy committed the murder directly or if they felt he aided, assisted, or encouraged it. They didn't have to agree on those details. The only thing they needed to agree on was that the defendant was involved in the crime. The prosecutor wrapped up and said the jury will find that there was only one man who slashed Margaret Anderson's throat, and that was Randy Whiting. Defense attorney Mary Lou Robinson reminded the jury that all the terrible behavior in the back 40 should not result in a guilty verdict for a client. There was not one piece of physical evidence tying her client to the crime. She criticized the police for not searching Lukensmeyer or Hinton's homes. The defense also threw a lot of shade at Mark Lukensmeyer and pointed out that he did a lot of lying and covering up. He should have been the one on trial. That was not her fault. It was the state's. She tried to minimize the impact of Randy's running from the law by saying that he did so because he was fearful and ashamed about what went on in the back 40 that night. To combat the party to a crime instructions, she told the jury that the prosecution did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Behind closed doors, the jury voted right away. Some people were hesitant to vote for a conviction. They feared that Randy might be an innocent man. But as the discussion shifted to the party to a crime instructions, that gave indecisive jurors additional leeway to feel justified in voting for a conviction. Two hours later, Randy Gargoyle Whiting was guilty of first-degree murder. Randy showed no emotion when the verdict was read. The prosecution felt relief that this case was settled. But Prosecutor Nas did not celebrate for long because he had two more men to prepare for. Randy Gargoyle Whiting received life in prison. Immediately after the trial, the state went after Lukensmeyer and Hinton. They didn't want these men to disappear into the underground biker network, just as Stumpner and Whiting had done. When Lukensmeyer and Hinton were arrested, Chris Shevlik, Wayne Cruz, and Terry Affel were all served subpoenas. They charged both men with aiding and abetting aggravated assault, aiding and abetting kidnapping, and first-degree sexual assault. Hinton's trial was first, and he got off to a bumpy start. Hinton jumped from the squad car while handcuffed, but he was immediately recaptured. His trial was straightforward and ended as expected. He never took the stand in his own defense and was sentenced to 50 years. Lukensmeyer also did not take the stand in his own defense and received 50 years. Dennis Bobber Stumpner was in hiding and was doing a stellar job at keeping a low profile. They had arrested him for a DUI in Colorado, but he was living under an assumed name and the police did not run a check on his fingerprints. Before Margaret's murder, he used the name of a dead person from a Green Bay cemetery and got a driver's license, fishing license, and library card. These fabricated documents were enough to earn Bobber a driver's license in Colorado. So even with the DUIs, the police didn't find out his real identity. Green Bay Detective Rogalski and his wife watched a brand new police show called America's Most Wanted. John Walsh hosted the show and used its viewing audience to capture fugitives. Each episode had John's narration along with reenactment footage using actors, which was interspersed with interviews. Each episode had photos of the featured fugitives and a toll-free number to call with tips, 1-800-CRIME-TV. Detective Rogalski's wife said they should put Dennis Stumpner on that show. He thought it was an excellent idea and got in contact with the show's producers. The mayor of Green Bay was not so keen on this and thought that it would paint the city in a bad light. 
Detective Rogalski did not drop the idea and approached the district attorney about it. The DA convinced Green Bay's mayor, who eventually gave it the thumbs up. The night the show aired, 300 calls came in. After they sorted all the tips, there were two from Golden, Colorado. The caller said Stumpner was taking care of horses on a ranch. They faxed a photo to Golden Law Enforcement, who took Stumpner into custody. He had worked on that ranch prior to the murder, so it made sense that he would run back to a place he was familiar with. They convicted Stumpner in October 1988, almost five years after the murder. He received 50 years, just like Hinton and Lukensmeyer. Truth and sentencing guidelines were not passed in Wisconsin until 1998. Before that, prisoners often served less than half the prison time. Hinton, Lukensmeyer, and Stumpner's 50-year sentences were actually a mandatory release after 22 years. Hinton was released in 2007, Lukensmeyer in 2008, and Stumpner in 2011. It was last reported that Hinton was living in Oxford, Wisconsin, Lukensmeyer in Denmark, Wisconsin, and Dennis Stumpner in Berlin, Wisconsin. Randy Whiting remains in prison. He went through several appeals, even stating that if he knew the state was going to invoke the party to crime instructions to the jury, that he would have testified at his trial or introduced evidence. All of his appeals have been denied. Whiting is parole eligible, but is unlikely to see the light of day. Frank Frog Seabance was convicted of harboring a fugitive and received two years in prison, but had work release privileges. Seaban served his time and worked at the Paradise Club, an adult entertainment establishment that had ties to the DC Eagles. Vicki Chamberlain Whiting went into hiding to escape the world of the bikers and gave birth to their son. She divorced Whiting and went on to college to earn degrees in social work and criminal justice. After graduation, she went to work for the prison system. Terry Weasel Affle was never prosecuted for any crime in connection to Margaret Anderson's murder. Prosecutor Peter Naz became a judge and eventually retired, and unfortunately he died from cancer in 2009. Detective Perrins retired from the police department and was the head of the Green Bay Packers security. After experiencing health issues, he dropped down to a part-time role. Detective Dave Steger became the sheriff of Lang Lake County and runs a bowling alley in Anago, Wisconsin. Bob Anderson Sr. passed away from cancer. Margaret's son, Bobby Jr., struggles with the way he lost his mother. He lives in Door County, Wisconsin, and misses Margaret dearly. What happened in the bar that night was pieced together from physical evidence, participant statements from interviews with police, and trial testimony. While Randy Whiting is the only person who remains in prison, truthfully, there are only four men that know exactly what went on on that night at the Back 40. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources and music used in this episode. If you like talking about true crime cases, join the Beyond Contempt Podcast Facebook group. Bring the show by leaving a positive review in Apple Podcasts. And thanks for listening.